So thanks so much for joining us for another webinar in our series DLT and blockchain in the real world. Uh, we created this series to try and highlight how Hedera Hashgraph is being used in production for a variety of new and existing real world applications with real users and customers. In our past webinars, we've learned uh, a lot about a different variety of companies across different industries, such as media and entertainment, healthcare, agriculture, advertising, um, so much more around tokenization and data integrity. And we've even had uh, Jim on our webinar uh, in the past, I think at least a couple of times, um, talking with him about uh, some products at Acor. And today in this webinar, we're gonna be diving into certain aspects of uh, data privacy. And when it comes to distributed ledger technologies, how those two can be incorporated uh, into each other. And today, you know, we've got uh, the company Acor with their recent product Rights Hash. Uh, Jim Nasser is the CEO there. And Rights Hash uses non fungible tokens on Hedera to represent and manage uh, any digital asset and its rights and protections. So, as mentioned, we've got Jim, the CEO of Acor, on today. And we have Deborah Farber, who is the privacy strategist at Hedera. And we're going to dive into some of the challenges that exist in the data protection and privacy space and how DLT can help overcome those challenges. And today's webinar is going to be a little bit more conversational, I think, between Deborah and Jim. And so we're super excited to learn from our experts. Uh, we'll leave some time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. Um, there's a Q&A box uh, in the Zoom chat. So be sure to drop your questions in that Q&A box, not in the chat. It's going to preserve the question and then we'll be sure to answer everything at the end. Um, so let's get started. Uh, to kick things off, I'm going to do a quick overview of Hedera and the token service for those of you who are joining who are new. And then I'm going to pass things off to uh, Deborah to dive in. So on the screen here, we have uh, the complete overview of the Hedera ecosystem. So you've got Hashgraph consensus. It's the only public ledger that utilizes Hashgraph consensus is Hedera. Uh, it underlies uh, all of the network and the network services. It's incredibly efficient and it's what uh, allows Hedera to be fast and secure. Uh, on top of the Hashgraph consensus on the network, there are the variety of primary network services, the consensus service, the token service, and then smart contracts, which you just announced recently and is coming down the line, a revamped version of it. The Hedera Governing Council governs all of the services and the code base and makes decisions for the network, manages the treasury. And then you've got application use cases that exist on top of those primary services, uh, all across functional use cases like data integrity, tokenization, decentralized identity. Um, and so today we're gonna be obviously diving in a little bit around tokenization. And then there's end users, people who are utilizing these applications, whether it's a business that's trying to use an API to build their application, uh, sort of like what Rights Hash is doing, or you know, consumers uh, that are just using an application that is directly built on top of Hedera. So some of the challenges that we've seen in tokenization today uh, that we've identified is a fluctuation in transaction fees. Um, as you've seen on the Ethereum network and others, uh, as soon as there's an overload of users and transactions, the fees for the network end up skyrocketing. There's slow performance on a lot of these networks, especially when it comes to proof of work networks. Um, and then there's also the threat of network forks. So the idea that if uh, the governance of the community decides that they wanna go in one direction versus the other, the network splits. If you've got NFTs or other tokens that are built on the network, then all of a sudden application developers have to make a decision about uh, which direction they wanna go. There's two NFTs that exist. It becomes um, pretty complicated. So Adara overcomes um, all of these challenges, um, specifically in tokenization through the Hedera token service. And the Hedera token service offers native tokenization for fungible and non-fungible tokens. It includes a number of compliance functionalities like KYC flags that we anticipate coming down the line uh, for applications that are trying to be regulatory compliant. There's programmability built in. So recently we've launched uh, you know, scheduled transactions or atomic swaps of tokens and the ability to do royalty fees. 
Um, speaking of fees, low and predictable fees. So uh, on Hedera, fees are set at a consistent price based in US dollars, but paid in HBAR. So to transfer a token on Hedera, it only costs 0 0.001 cents US dollars paid in HBAR. And uh, the transaction fees are always stable. There's built-in governance. So uh, you know the governing council of Hedera, uh, large global organizations, it prevents the network from being able to fork as described before. Um, and then there's native tokens. So all the tokens on Hedera get the uh, native efficiencies and security and performance that the underlying Hashgraph consensus provides. Um, we'll dive into the governing council a little bit and then pass things off to, uh, to Deborah. So the governing council is incredibly decentralized. It's up to 39 leading global organizations. Today there's 22 that exist. They're across a variety of different industries. We have a couple universities and uh, a major nonprofit. All of the governing members are required to run a network node. So today the network is permissioned and ran by those members, but later uh, it will be permissionless. So we're going on a path to complete decentralization of the network. Uh, there's term limits. There's a variety of committees that folks on the governing council have joined uh, based on their expertise and they all have an equal vote. So no one has more say than anybody else. And these are the list of our existing governing council members. And, um, and you can find more information about the governing council at hedera.com forward slash council. And with that, uh, I'm gonna pass things off to Deborah, and we'll kick things off. Excellent. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here. Hope this works out well. Uh, and presenter view is okay cool uh okay so this um so i'm deborah farber and uh and like brady said i'm the privacy strategist uh, at hedera hashgraph and my background's really in privacy data protection uh governance ethical tech and so um what i'm going to do today is really just kind of take the baton from Brady, uh, kind of give you a little crash course in data protection rights, like what, you know, and so that I can then tee it up for Jim to explain how he's built uh, rights hash uh, using Hedera token service on, um, uh, you know, a, a, in order to protect uh, various digital rights, including personal data rights. Um, so to begin, you know, what I really want you to get out of this portion of the presentation is that, you know, there are certain responsibilities to protect personal data, uh, whether you're building a DAP, uh, a, a, uh, an AppNet, or DAO, or literally anything on, um, on Hedera or any DLT. Uh, so let's see, to begin. Okay, so obviously we want to talk a little bit about centralization and decentralization as we're talking about privacy. And I, and I, I really think that this topic, when it's talked about in DLT, um, sometimes misses the mark in terms of holistically talking about why centralization is a challenge. And so you know, I want to point out that the first is that if you centralize all your personal data or all your assets that are super uh, uh, you know, the, the keys to your kingdom or, or, or everything that your company, you know, all the data your company needs, um, then you're going to have a challenge it, it, since it's the single point of failure. And you see security teams trying to do whatever they can to have a security in depth uh, approach to protecting personal data. Um, so centralization of personal data creates a single point of failure, right? It's serving as a target for criminal hackers. Um, and then, you know, it's especially uh, centralization as a challenge uh, because the big tech giants have kind of created a, a deep power imbalance by being the central stores and uh, arbiters of what can be on the platform or not. Um, and therefore, you know, this power imbalance has kind of created, uh, you know, an effect where consumers or even other businesses feel like they can't make meaningful choices uh, when, you know, they're being pushed to do certain things through behavioral advertising that tracks us and uh, on the internet and dark patterns that uh, are, are deployed in, in our tech to kind of manipulate individuals into turning over more information about ourselves, right? Uh, and then so oftentimes there's opaque privacy notices 
that purport to care about privacy, but either there's not sufficient transparency in them or the privacy notice is literally transparently telling you how the company is, uh, you know, exploiting you and exploiting your privacy. Um, so with the advent of massive data breaches, the rise of surveillance capitalism, and then increased distrust in centralized authorities, right? Like big tech giants, but also governments and, and, and others who might hold power around the world. Um, obviously we're aware of this trend that people are continuing to feel like they've lost control. And so by decentralizing, um, Hedera and other DLT uh, companies are putting you know, they're aiming to put control over personal information back into the hands of individuals themselves rather than the centralized authorities. And the privacy relation here is, um, so the EU has enacted the general data protection regulation known as the GDPR in 2018 to address these concerns. And, you know, this kind of become the gold standard around the world for similar legislation. So we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, the, the entire Latin America uh, through LGPD, which it, it, they passed a GDPR like law that's you know pretty much ripped from uh, the original EU GDPR. We're, we're seeing you know California and Virginia and Colorado uh, pass state law legislation because it's taking so long for uh, the US to kind of get a federal law and that's a whole nother webinar as to why. Um, so, so the point is, um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about, you know, the emergence of these laws, um, and then, you know, give you a little bit of a background. So I also mentioned, in, uh, in addition to LGPD, which is the Brazil's data protection regulation and is kind of you know, uh, affecting that the Latin American region, uh, there's also India just passed the PD. PB, which is their version, uh, and China also just uh, passed the Personal Information Protection Law, PIPL. So, you know, even China has a data protection law, doesn't cover the federal government, but like it covers at least businesses. The US still is working on getting their act together. Um, so what I want to get uh, you to understand is that largely, I'm not going to distinguish between all the various laws. That would just be a completely different webinar. And honestly, I'm leveling this up so that you could get the essential uh, understanding as to your your requirements, your liability, and what's expected of DAP uh, developers. Um, so what's good is that these laws are largely following the same privacy principles. They might have a little bit of differences here and there. Some might emphasize some things like localizing data over other companies, which which don't require, or sorry, other jurisdictions, which don't require you keep the personal data within an organization's, uh, I'm sorry, within a legal jurisdiction. Um, but they're all practically the same. And therefore we can talk about global data protection laws and requirements uh, holistically instead of new in a, a local way. Um, they also require organizations to design and develop products and services with a data protection by design and default approach. Uh, uh, many people in the United States, we call that privacy by design. I want to get, you know, make it clear that this design approach is, um, it may sound lofty and like, okay, it's not a key requirement, it's an approach. It is literally baked into these privacy laws, uh, at least in the EU and, in, and outside the US, that data protection by design and default is, is a legal requirement that you should be embedding into your organizational processes. Uh, the next is that there's a whole slew of new data protection rights. And, and this is where I'm going to be focusing the conversation, outlining the new rights that are afforded to individuals around the world uh, that are wonderful, right? We're all here for, for, for more rights, more empowerment of users, but you need to understand that the rights to users become obligations to companies, right? You, it's your obligation to be respecting these rights to facilitate them. And in many ways using technology to uh, facilitate them. Um, and lastly, and, and I think most importantly, uh, is that these laws require accountability and we'll get into what the accountability requirements are, but you need to demonstrate your compliance. You can't just do checkbox compliance. You need to be able to show the outputs, assurances, record keeping, and, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, and when building dApps on uh, any DLT, you know, developers and architects need to understand that data protection requirements um, 
you know, uh, and then uh, you know what constitutes personal data, uh, and how personal data flows through your service, and how you can provide or delete that personal data if you're asked to do so. Um, so the first thing I want to get across, and this isn't like the specific definition of any particular law. This is just basically, if you practically, if you look at privacy and person and, and data protection laws. Personal data or personal information is, is, has been broadened over the years. It is anything that is linked to an identity or linkable to an identity. So you, you want to you know, turn something no longer into personal data. And there's, we're not going to talk about all those ways today, like whether it's anonymous, anonymization, pseudonymization, or other, many of the other techniques, privacy enhancing technologies. But you need to understand that you, you, you need to completely sever a link back to an identity if you want to call something anonymous. And therefore, when you're putting, putting personal data, or you're putting data at all on the blockchain, you have to be very careful, uh, or hash graph, right? You got to be very careful that it's something that can be immutable and live there and will not put a person in jeopardy because their privacy is compromised or put you your organization in jeopardy. So this is a key point, which is why I gave it its own slide. Personal data could be things like metadata. It could be things like, you know, my shoe size. Uh, in fact, that's considered, you know, health data even in, in the, um, the EU. Uh, it could be an IP address, right? It could be log files that are connected to an individual. So speak with your lawyers and consultants. This is a very you know, high level presentation. I'm not covering everything, but that's a key point. Um, now, this is the slide that I think is the most important for this conversation to tee it up for, for uh, why it's important, why what Jim and um, ACOR uh, and what they're doing with Rights Hash is so exciting, uh, at least to me, but should be to many uh, organizations. Um, because we have this, obligation to facilitate data protection rights. And um, the GDPR and, and, you know, like I said, similar global privacy laws grant these rights to individuals that give them more control over how their personal data is used. And decentralized apps and the companies that own them uh, must build data protection rights fulfillment into their technology and processes, supported by key people um, right, you gotta have people who are accountable and own these processes. And so that first right might be obviously familiar to you. You see this in a lot of privacy policies. You know, you have a right to access, um, which is when someone asks you for a copy of their data you have on them. It's it's this is also known as a data subject access request or DSAR in the United in the EU and elsewhere in the United States. We tend to call them access requests. Uh, you have a right to object. And this means that people can object to specific processing activity, uh, you know, purposes of their personal data. Um, and if they say, look, uh, yeah, I might have granted you the uh, rights to use it in the, in the past, but now I want to revoke that right, you know, or, uh, you know, I object to you using it for this purpose, you have obligations to stop using their data for that, those certain purposes, unless you have a a good reason to continue. And when I say a good reason, there's certain legal bases and I'm not gonna get into what those are, but, um, oops, went to the wrong slide. Uh, the next one is the right to be informed. And this usually means that you have to tell people that you have their data, <laughs> right? Through, usually through a privacy policy uh, and contextual, uh, you know, just in time notices. And then you also need to explain what are you doing with that data and like why you're collecting it. Um, the next right is the right of rectification. And this, you know, and this is GDPR language, but basically it means, you know, you can correct your data if it's not, if it's not accurate and, and, you know, keeping accurate data is a privacy, uh, obligation as well as, as security and just, you know, good, good operational hygiene. Um, but, you know, you basically need to make allow people to be able to correct and amend their data if it's not accurate. So again, this is really when thinking about Web three technologies and DLT. You know what you're putting on chain is very is very um, important because the immutability is the point. And so there are ways to be able to hide uh, actual. You know there there are ways to be able to facilitate this that Jim is going to uh, articulate. The next is the right to erasure, or right to deletion or right to be forgotten. You know, it's got different names, but it, you know, in essence, you have a right to ask to ask that your data be deleted, uh, personal data. 
Um, it's and uh, there are situations where you may not have the obligation to have to actually delete the data, but you have the right to ask for it. And you have to be able to respond to people when they they say when they ask to have their data deleted. Um, and and there's a whole process there. Then there's the right to restrict processing. Uh, this means that you have to temporarily stop processing someone's data if they ask you to. Uh, you can still store it, but not use it. Um, and this isn't an absolute right and only applies in certain circumstances, but it's definitely one of the GDPR rights. So I wanted you to know about it. The right to data portability. So this doesn't really seem like privacy, right? I mean, there's so reasons, reasons for that. Um, the GDPR is is a data protect so so privacy is enshrined in uh pretty much uh, the the constitution so to speak in the eu right like it's it's fundamental the rights to privacy are already documented elsewhere as a fundamental right so the gdpr goes beyond just privacy and talks about protecting data uh from a privacy security you know ethical and transparent way, but all, and, and one of the things is data portability. You don't want large organizations to be able to, you know, uh, you're stuck using them, which is the case right now with a lot of big tech. The idea is you should be able to take your data and unplug that data from one uh, organization and be able to just, you know, plug it into another organization and get services there. So this ability to um, make it easy for you to, prov um, you know, uh, to, to, as a consumer to be able to take your data elsewhere, make that choice. Uh, then there's a right about, you know, that a person, uh, if personal data is processed entirely by an automatic means, um, and this might have a legal or similarly significant effect on a person. So think credit, right? Like are you, you know, something that's automatic, automated, and then you, you, you could have a real negative experience, a positive experience, uh, it, but it could really hurt you if, if there's a mistake, right? If AI all of a sudden made a mistake or there was bias in there. So uh, you have a right basically to re request that in these situations, you have a human that in, is involved in the processing and, and reviews that so that there's actually a human um, intervention and it's not just automatic. Um, and then California adds additional rights. Uh, so California consumers have the right to restrict the sale of personal data to third parties. So companies who sell personal data to third parties have to include an opt-out link uh, on their main website that says, do not sell, you know, uh, do not sell my personal information basically. And, you know, you're allowed to opt out. Uh, the important thing is it's opt out, not opt in there. Um, and then California CP CCPA also grants a, a right to uh, non-discrimination for exercising one's CCPA rights. So as you can see, there's a lot going on here and I don't have that many more slides, but just wanted to, so to, to, to kind of wrap this up uh, on accountability, right? So there is an obligation in the GDPR uh, and all the, all the global privacy laws to demonstrate privacy and data protection compliance. And what this means is really three things record keeping requirements. So global privacy and data protection regulations have numerous record keeping requirements. Um, they include like maintain uh, an up-to-date privacy notice that's easy, easily accessible, uh, adopt and implement data protection policies, put written contracts in place with organizations that process personal data on your behalf, um, conduct uh, impact assessments. Uh, sometimes they're known as privacy impact assessments or data protection impact assessments, but you know, determine those risks to privacy and privacy of the people, not just to the data, but what's the risk to the individuals behind the data. That's the important risk modeling viewpoint to, to, to look at. Um, and then also the important maintain documentation of your organization's personal data processing activities. And this can be a lot. This, if, you're, if you're a large organization, this is like, <laughs> Huge undertaking. So, so what I love so much about DLT is that we have an opportunity to, if you're starting to build a DAP from the scratch now, uh, you could build it right, build it with privacy by design, make your make your company more sustainable for the long term. Uh, the next is security. Your organization's responsible for putting in place appropriate security measures to prevent the personal data that you hold from being accidentally or deliberately compromised. 
And in order to determine whether your security measures are appropriate, uh, you need to take a risk-based approach. And you should review the personal data that you hold and the way your organization uses it in order to assess how valuable, sensitive, or confidential it is, as well as the harms it may cause if that data was compromised. And then lastly, but definitely not least, this is the part I'm most uh, interested in because there's so much opportunity for innovation and privacy here, uh, especially like we're here to talk about some of that, um, but privacy assurances. And privacy assurance is the measure of confidence that the data protection features, practices, procedures, and architecture of an information system are uh, accurately in, or accurately enforces the privacy policy. Uh, so assurance is determined from the evidence produced by your assessment process and evidence can be stored in logs as a hash on the hash graph or blockchain uh, in databases or, or elsewhere, right? Other data stores. So you need to make sure that you can demonstrate the effectiveness of your privacy and data protection controls by making evidence easily accessible and available. Um, for example, record when customers consented to collection and use of their data for a particular purpose uh, or request a deletion of their data. Um, Opt-outs, data localizations, uh, you know, pseudonymizing data. Uh, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of ways in which you could create uh, assurances that something is pseudonymized or anonymized or, you know, um, it meets a certain requirement. And so with that, I want to pass this over to Jim um, to talk about Rights Hash and how his product is, is building on Hedera uh, a token service to be able to uh, you know, better protect your rights and, and effectuate these data, um, uh, these data rights in a privacy preserving and secure manner. So Jim, you're up. All righty, thank you, Deborah, I appreciate that was uh that was, yeah i appreciate that brilliant lecture i was just making notes myself i'm like i gotta make sure i remember that as well so uh sure. let me share my screen um i appreciate uh, that kickoff let me just share my screen can you guys see my screen mm, all right that silence is deafening i'm gonna say yes 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 i can yes i can right. it's not at full screen but we can see it I'm going to make a full screen real quick. So I'm going to be very quick and brief on the slides because I think Deborah did a fantastic job um, on the background. And I don't really need to do that. I'd rather actually do demos and, or do a demo and tempt fate and, and just kind of uh, show you in, in reality what, what Bryce Hash looks like, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and things like this. So just, you know, um, in a brief summary, Rice Hash really is, is an engine. It's a software engine. Uh, we very much believe in this idea of building software as, as if you like gears, what we think of ourselves as a gear makers and, and most of you guys in the community, you know, as, as perhaps the watchmakers, you know, uh, could you build every single gear that goes into a watch yourself? Yeah, you probably could, but does it make sense? Does it make sense to do so? Uh, you know, because there's a lot of fidelity and, and specialized skills required to do kind of that kind of uh high quality gear building, if you like, it, it takes any metaphor. So that's really what we think about Rice Hash. It's an engine for really very, very easily to allow you to, um, to represent any digital asset using NFTs. And, and I know at the beginning, Brady mentioned um, the Hedera token services and, and Deborah you mentioned it as well. I just want to be clear though, we actually use HCS, Hedera Consensus Service, uh, in, in the majority of our use cases for um, rice hash, and, and there's a number of reasons for it, uh, but primarily our whole thinking about rice hash is high utility, high volume, uh, low variability, high compliance. It's, it's not one, you know, it's, it's not like a traditional marketplace type of place, it's much more about the utility. Uh, and I'm happy to kind of get into the bits and bytes of HCS versus HTS, uh, you know, with you guys and, and things like you know, kind of uh, custom NFTs and all of that at a later time. I don't think that's the right forum for it, but just so you guys know. Um, the net of it though is that the technology basically is, is serverless, open APIs. Uh, as with everything we do, and, and you know, thankfully Hedera supports is, is real time and, and, and very much we're kind of believers of, of can you use a public DLT to, as Deborah said, basically prove accountability. Uh, we think that's where it's at. 
certainly in the world of healthcare. I, I won't get on the soapbox and talk about all the things that are wrong in healthcare. There's plenty. Uh, you know, consent is one area, but there, there's so much. But 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 you know, we've been profligate. There's been so much wastefulness, and I think being accountable, being transparent, is a step forward. Okay, doc. Um, why Hedera? I think most of you guys who know me, you've heard me talk about this. We've shared this slide, I think, before. Uh, really, it's many things that we all kind of know about in this community. But but it's the net of it. I think is is the fact that. We think Hedera is, is a practical implementation. There are plenty of organizations and plenty of, of uh, DLTs that promise a lot, but for one reason or another, it's not quite the right fit, whether it's pricing, whether it's quote scalability, though you know, we can get to layer two conversations that, that we're gonna avoid today. Um, it, it could be really around the, honestly, stability of the organization. There's a lot to be said for people like Lehman and Mance, the 100 year vision, the, Governance Council, you look around, look at some of the other uh, DLTs and infrastructure out there. See if you, you see the same kind of thing. Uh, Brady mentioned forking, you know, the, the whole Ethereum forking, the fighting, infighting uh, you know, between um, Ethereum developers and the factions there, as well as uh, Bitcoin core developers and, and so on. That's, you know, it becomes a real concern when you're building uh, essentially very kind of what, what you would expect to be very stable, very conservative type solutions, such as compliance solutions on top of that infrastructure. Are you, are you willing to bet your business and your customers on technologies that, that can easily be fractionalized? So all these things to say that, you know, we, we kind of think that Hedera really meets our needs. It's not necessarily, you know, we're not saying it's a civil bullet for everything, but, but from the way uh, we think about the opportunity, we think it's a really good fit. Um, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate how we do privacy preserving and then adoption really ultimately comes down to uh, exposing functionality using open technologies, open APIs, very, very easy to consume. Exactly the same way as you would consume Google Maps as an example. That's how you would use our technology, super simple. Um, so I kind of like, I like metaphors and I think it's important to to try and think about like the bigger picture. So the bigger picture, when you have a DLT type solution and we, you let people know about it, is that, you know, it's, kind of, it's what's called the Hawthorne effect in my, my opinion, which is, you know, I always feel like somebody's watching me, right? You know, it's back in the day, early eighties with the song. Um, so the Hawthorne effect is all about the fact that if you know you're being watched, chances are you're gonna behave well, you're gonna be a good actor. You know, again, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the, the inventor of this idea. However, however, empirically it's been proven. I kind of believe in that. I think we see the evidence of it. Okay, doke. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to kind of talk to you about a specific example because I can do a number of different things with Rice Hash uh, around digital assets. However, I think the area that's really interesting, the one we've spent quite a bit of time and effort on, particularly with one of our uh, clients, uh, a real pioneer in this space called Consent Custody, is, is around the idea of consent, uh, which is really about an individual providing consent for, for things to happen. Uh, essentially, agreement, for instance, for your information to be used in inclusion exclusion criteria for a clinical trial, uh, you know, or your child's, or 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 consent to even use an application or, or and the ability to, to change that consent, to monitor what's happening with the consent, to who's used it. I think, again, Deborah did a good job explaining the difference between uh, some of the regulations and, and how GDPR and CCPA talk about the CCPA being the California Consumer Protection Act, talk about, uh, you know, kind of consent and, and, and this idea that if, uh, hey, you know, in California, if somebody's going to monetize your data, you need to know about it. You know, and, and it's, it's a little bit hokey that, that you get the option to opt out versus opt in. Uh, but, but regardless, I think it's, it's one that whether you buy into nudge theory or not, you know, it's one that uh, I think is important because it allows you as an individual to make a choice. And we think that our technology really is, is helping enable that and make it easier, make it make it simpler for developers. Uh, and really the net of this picture is, is that, you know, we, we use it there in real time. We take transactions and there's a, an internal database secure encrypted your traditional kind of database structure where you store transactions. However, there is a reference, there's an immutable uh, public globally uh, kind of indivisible reference using a Hedera NFT. That reference, an encrypted reference or, or really a token ID, right? You know, in simple terms, that's the thing that shows the breadcrumbing that shows the flow of transactions. I'm gonna demonstrate that. Um, and you can see this is an example of, of who may be involved in this kind of a situation for a, for a consent NFT. So you got 
you know, regulators and of course, individuals, partners, sponsors are ph typically pharmaceutical firms, because uh, could be clinical research organizations and so on, consortia, marketplace, so on and so forth. That's, so its utility really is, is for a number of different stakeholders. Okay, look, I'm gonna get into demo uh, just before I do this. Uh, again, Deborah already talked about this at length. I'm just really zooming in on this idea of basis for consent. All right, let's do this. Uh, let me go into my other window, close things. Um, okay. Hopefully you guys can see my screen. We have a public webpage, um, ricehash.com. If you guys want to go and peruse around, it's just uh, high level information about kind of what we're doing, why we're doing it, things like this. I mentioned already that we're working exclusively with Consent Custody Corporation. Um, and uh, the CEO, Brandon McSheffrey, is a, you know, a good uh, friend and colleague of mine and, and incredibly knowledgeable in this area. So if you're interested in the whys and the where's of, of like managing consent in this new world and this idea of, of how, you know, how do you essentially act as a fiduciary and a custodian for, for an individual, which is really the genesis behind consent custody, uh, you know, I can certainly connect you to him. But without further ado, let me get into a demo. Um, I'm gonna actually use a consent custody sandbox because I think it's much more uh, specific and, and in context. So um, we're going to go ahead. And by the way, I, I am completely live. Uh, you can kind of see the demo. So do apologize if anything's slow or whatever. Hopefully, you know, I won. You know, I I did a demo last week to a potential client and, and a collaborator, and for the first time in, in like fifty demos, my entire network just was collapsing. So I'm hoping that doesn't happen again today. Uh, but I'm going to just hop into this. We have this idea of consent, and by the way, this is not neither a novel idea, nor is it, is it kind of like a mutually inclusive idea, but, but we have this idea that for consent, the organizations involved, the users involved within the organizations uh, or associates organization, and then there's places where you store things. You could have some other forms of, of layers of, of, of organization or, or ways in which you describe it, but I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna do this live. So let's call this uh, Hedera, uh, you know, Privacy Corp, right? You'll notice straight away that that's the name of the company, we call that the ID. However, we have this very long, what we call the opaque ID, which ends in 5F, um, being generated in real time and using a one-time what we call certification key. So it's, it's a one-time, one-way encryption. Um, Deborah mentioned this idea of synonymization. This is really one of the ways in which we do it. We do a lot of very sophisticated encryption, linking of, of encryption for, for sequence checking, but also, pseudonymization because we believe that certain information like this actually needs to be in a public ledger, uh, or at least could be, you know, maybe it doesn't need to be, but it could be. So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna submit this request. Uh, it's a real time interaction. You can see it's said uh, submitted successfully. I'm gonna go into our Explorer view. Our Explorer view is basically, if you like, this is kind of a, one of our clients calls this uh, automated autonomous logging on steroids. So it kind of shows everything that we're doing in real time. You, you notice as, as I was chatting that a transaction just appeared here on, on the transaction log. Uh, this is uh, the transaction ID. This, those of you guys familiar with, with Hedera would know this is a transaction ID that uh, you know is Hedera centric. So I'm gonna go in and, and just immediately pop in into basically what we call our ledger explorer as part of our hash log technology. But, but the net of it is, is we essentially inquire uh, from two different sources, Hedera's own uh, Explorer, as well as Dragon Glass, our partner Dragon Glass. We, we inquire about this transaction, that's the transaction ID, you see it, right? So, so you'll see it says success, both of them, hence the 100% score. Both of them basically report the same thing, more or less in real time. You can see that's a course pair ID, this is our cryptographic signature. But I think that's interesting here is, is you can see the account ID, right? It's not, it doesn't say Hedera privacy, Corp, it says that long opaque number that I created in a one-time, uh, with a one-time uh, kind of certification, right? Um, so just, just keep an eye on this. Those of you guys who are interested in the real bits and bytes, if you wanted to, you can go to Dragon Glass. They're not associated to us. You can see, you can see the, the fees that was incurred. If you're really, really into the, the geeky side of it, you can look at the JSON as well. So I'll leave that to your leisure to do that, but, uh, but I'm not gonna do it anymore at this stage. Um, I'm gonna go back here and I'm just gonna continue this, this idea. So, so we have, uh, we just created an organization. 
I'm going to go and actually create a user for this organization. The latest organization, 5F, that's, that's the one that we just created. I'm going to go and create a user and uh, let's create that right here. And you can see, uh, again, we do a one, one way, one time encryption, uh, rather, pseudonymization. But I'm also going to add on the fly indexing, which is a really powerful concept because, um, because this allows you to add things that can be both surface metadata, but also index and searchable. And, and you could do it without having to create a, a giant database beforehand. So I'm going to say privacy expert, uh, and I'm going to add another data. And let, let's say it's, it's location. And we're going to say, um, you yeah, know, Washington. All right, so I'm going to say Portland. OK, so I'm going to submit that. Again, um, this is happening in real time, right? This is going to go there. I'm going to, at the same time, also go and just create a store, use the same organization as before. There is no store. I'm going to call it demo. I don't have to give it a specific name, but I'm going to. And, uh, you know, off we go. So that's also happening in real time. And then just to prove you guys that I'm not making this up, you can see things are happening, right? This is like the transaction. And hopefully shortly, there'll be another one that pops up that says, oh, here we go, in real time. Uh, but anyway, as you guys are looking at this, I'm going to show you that there's, there's a bunch of things. We, we show the NFTs that are being created in real time, the tokens, the transactions associated. We really truly believe in this idea of accountability. Deborah mentioned it. It may sound a little bit hokey, but, but I don't think it's hokey in the context of a conservative regulated industry like healthcare. Uh, or education or construction. You now, th th these compliance things are, are things that matter. We're not we're not talking about you know putting uh, like gifs on, on an NFT. We're talking about potentially associating people's personal health data or, or um, you know or genomic data and things like this here. Uh, one other thing I want to show you just real brief. Though I'm not going to get into it. Part of the sophistication of what we do is is a really quite a um, advanced state of the art. Uh, distribution of nodes. You can see we have seven nodes. Uh, we have four in the US, we have one in Sao Paulo, Brazil, one in Frankfurt, and one in Hong Kong. Uh, that's the names, you can see transactions on it. Uh, obviously, most of you guys know Hedera's, that's the 20 active ones around the world as well. But we also not only have the ability to do full tolerance and, and load balancing in this way, but also regulatory compliance. So Deborah mentioned the, the new laws, even PIPOL in, in China, uh, or, or the new uh, consumer protection laws in India, or, or obviously GDPR, we have the ability to do the actual storage in a specific location. Uh, and that's a really important thing because end of the day, to be compliant, it's not just a case of saying we're encrypted and, and you know, we're following standards. It's at times it's about the physical processing and the physical location of what we do as well. All right, I'm gonna hop back here and, and um, just show you kind of where we're at. So, um, we created user, we created a, uh, a store. I'm gonna go and actually create a consent now. So we're gonna go and select the organization. That was the, the, the moniker for Hedera Privacy Corp. Here's Deborah's user. This is the default storage. You'll notice there's no nothing there right now. Uh, I'm gonna move my Zoom thing and go into my Explorer. So well, we have a few uh, demo files. This is a very typical um, consent agreement. It's, it's one that most of you guys are probably familiar with, where you go and sign a PDF. Um, you know, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller so it's manageable, right? You can see, you know, this is for um, uh, a, a, a drug, uh, copeptine, uh, and essentially, it's, it's a it's a consent from a parent. In this case, it's me. Uh, agreeing for my child to participate in this clinical trial, I signed it, and the physician signed it. That's a pretty normal thing, right? So um, I'm going to drag that in here. And you'll notice that immediately we create a hash of this because this hash is what we're going to reference on a public DLT. Obviously, the file itself is, is that, and, and here's the size and so on. I'm going to submit this. Um, and then I'll also, since I'm here, I'm going to go back and uh, let's just make sure we go to the right organization because we have a lot of different ones here. And I'm going to actually show you the example of taking multiple files and not just one, because uh, you know you may have a situation um, where you can see again we do the same thing. I'm going to just take all three of them and and submit. You may have a situation where, for instance, you have a PDF, you have a transcript. Uh, of a conversation with a with a patient, and you may also have the, the raw MP3 file that you want to upload all of them and associate them into one consent document, or perhaps even 
all consent documents associated to one patient for a particular you know, interaction like, like a clinical trial is in one package, right? We don't dictate our technology being gear, ma gear makers. We don't dictate your business process. We just adapt to it. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of show you real quick what's happened here. And let's see if we have some consents. I'm gonna go back here and then choose Deborah, and, and then we'll see, you know, again, all of this is happening in real time. So um, these, uh, these are the consents that we put in here. You can see that's the first one with the one PDF and then here's the three. Um, th there's different states. So you could have, in this case, you have a draft state. You could have it enabled as we call it enabled. I'm gonna show you that, right? And enable basically means it's live, means that you know now you know this thing has been maybe verified offline. Maybe there's a need for doing some some verified credentials or, or whatever it is that, that you do. Again, we don't dictate the process. We're just stipulating that there's a state. Uh, and in this case, you know it's enabled. I'm going to enable this one as well. Real quick, I'm going to flip into the explorer just to show you what's happening. You can again see the transactions that are flowing. I think that was the first. Enablement, I can just real quickly show you that as, as we're waiting for this to happen. Um, you know, just, just so you guys know, I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. You can see this transaction, the function is enable consent, right right there. And, and you can again see the, the consent store, you can see the, who, who the um, uh, organization is and things like this, right? So just, I think we've already kind of done that. But let me go back here and, and I'm gonna refresh this real quick just to see the effect. So you can see now these have been in real time enabled. The thing that's really interesting though, is that now we have this new link that was never there before, this token ID, right? This is, this is the, the um, NFT that we've generated in real time. I'm going to, in this case, I'm gonna revoke one of them because I wanna show you what happens when you revoke it. Uh, obviously a consent can be created. Uh, it can be in, um, in use, it can be revoked, it could be renewed even, it could be, you know, recustody. There's all kinds of things it could do. Uh, and again, that it goes back to the policy and the business requirements of, of you know, of your client, uh, client organization. We have the ability to do any any which way, as, as they say, you know, in the song, we can do this, we could do that, but, but we don't dictate it. You know, our technology allows you to do what you need to do, right? So I'm gonna refresh this real quick. Um, and I'm conscious of time, so I don't want to bore you guys. You'll notice that's revoked, right? If I go into this NFT link, you'll see exactly what's been happening. But the, to me, this is really the secret sauce of what we're doing, right? The secret sauce is that, you know, we have this NFT, which is the unique, indivisible, global ID, basically, this long number. However, now we're showing all of the associated transactions uh, to this. So this, this is the idea of accountability, transparency, yet, privacy preserving work because now this NFT could be passed, you know, imagine if, if you had multiple consumer apps like your Apple Health Kit app or, or you know, whatever apps that you're using with for, for all kinds of different purposes and not necessarily just for clinical health, but it could be for, for you know, preventative health or, or wearable information or whatever. This consent ID could traverse all of those because this is global, this is unique. This is privacy preserving, and yet we can show all of the accountability, right? This, this last one was the one where we revoked the consent. Um, you know, so that's a pretty powerful idea. You can see within our internal database, we show the specific documents, but obviously if you go into the, you know, if you go into this, this link, you can see that's all the information, the timestamp and who did what, but if you go into the link, you're not gonna see the actual document, right? We're not gonna show the content of the consent. Right, because that would not be privacy preserving, right? You know, so again, we have our signature and, and we show that there's a revoke function and things like this. But what we don't show is what the actual consent was all about, who did it to whom, and any of those other things, because that would be a violation of many, many of the privacy things that we're obviously very interested in. Um, that's kind of it. I mean, there's a few other things I can show you real quick. You guys obviously are very familiar, I'm sure, with, with this idea of application consent. I mean, all of us do it for pretty much every app. And almost every time I go to Google, I consent to them, you know, using my data to become more of a product and, and losing data dignity. Um, but <laughs> what we kind of don't, again, we don't believe in that. We think, you know, if you're going to revoke consent, you know, you, you basically, in, in the case of our application, you're kicked out because, you know, you don't, you didn't consent to, to use it. If you agree, then what we do is, is that we basically, and I'm gonna go and show you here. Um, you can see now I've consented, there's a new consent and momentarily here, there will be an NFT generated in real time that we can see that, right? In real time to happen that says now 
this NFT essentially associates my consent for this particular time. And then why do we use NFT? And, and I think really the, the germane idea is this idea that it's an evidence of authenticity. That's the way we think of it, right? You know, we're not we're not trying to do royalties on this, right? This is this is a high utility kind of concept that they want to essentially abstract in, so people can can use it and, and rely on it as something that that's that's functional, but not not trying to build a marketplace out of it. However, this this idea that this is authentic is really really important, and you can kind of see the the history of, of the consents I've had, right? You can see that's all of the various consents in this demo app. Uh, and then you can see the current one is the one from uh, 1352, which reminds me I'm running out of time. Okay, that's uh, that's really it. I think that's uh, the stage I'm going to kind of stop. There's, there's a bunch of other things we have done and built, but I think that's probably sufficient for you guys to get a sense for kind of what we do, how we do it, why we do it, and, and all of that. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, I guess, Brady, it's, it's up to you now. Yeah, thanks so much for going through that, Jim. That was awesome. Um, a lot of great information there, and Deborah as well. So we've got some questions that have come through uh, in the Q&A box. And everyone remember, we've got this Q&A box that's live. So if you have any questions uh, for Deborah or Jim, please feel free to jump in there and ask away. Um, so we'll get started here. What are your thoughts on music publishing via NFTs? Any thoughts on digital rights for something like music? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer first and, and Deborah, feel free to add on. I mean, I, it certainly makes sense. Uh, I think to me, this is one of those things where it's like the, um, you know, the, the devil's in the, the detail, right? Because if you did music publishing with NFTs on, on Ethereum, you know, I, I would be like, is this really practical? Like, is, is this something that's, that's going to, you know, I mean, who, who could possibly, uh, unless it's like the first edition of, of like, a, you know, Beatles you know, hold my hand or something. Um, I, if you use Hedera, yeah, I mean, why not? You could definitely do it. You, and and then, then you could have the marketplace idea, then you could have the royalties, and then most likely you would use HCS. Like you wouldn't use HCS like we do because we, we're not interested in the royalties in the marketplace, not, not in that kind of a context. Uh, and HCS is, is a lower price approach than, than HTS would be. However, for music publishing, for sure. I mean, I think HTS, you got royalties. I mean, it's, it's a really good fit, right? You know, I think to me, the big thing though, Brady, is can you make it so it's usable? Because, because you know, like, like as a, you and I had a little sidebar about this. If, if a user had to have an app, log onto the app, have verified credentials for the app, one, then buy HBARS, two, then buy the, the minted, you know, like your, company XYZ's minted tokens three, you just gotta think, is that practical? Like, like, I mean, how onerous is that process gonna be? So to me, this is about like really thinking through application design uh, and not so much the underlying NFTs because NFTs will work. That's just a really great answer. I don't have that much to add other than to extract out that I think you, you were saying, if something is of really high value, then like, a, annoying gas fee on Ethereum may still be doable, right? That's what you're saying, like a Beatles album or whatever, but but for small valued transactions, um, yeah, Ethereum just kind of seems like it's not viable, like economically viable for as a business model for, for yeah, for NFTs. Um, but uh, all the rest of what you said, I mean, I don't really have much else to add. And then just, just one thing to add, and, and this is my, my general soapbox, you guys know me, I kind of think, you know, when we're talking blockchain in this day and age, in circa 2021, not like 2015 or 16 or 17, where it was kind of a novelty, we got to think, well, how is it sustainable, right? Uh, how, how can you do, like, 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 do you have to be LeBron to, to, to be a consumer of it or to be a producer of it? And, and if that's the answer, that's not really, I don't think that's a very good answer, right? Because not everybody can afford to have million dollar gifs of their dunks, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a, um, there is actually, you know, Jim mentioned HCS versus HC, uh, HTS for tokenization. So we can send out, um, there's a few tutorials that were done early on around uh, tokenization with HCS, which is another, another way to go about doing it. Um, to Jim's point, yeah, no, no marketplace aspect of it, but, um, you know, it all depends on the right tool for the right use case. Um, Question from Greg, why do you think the US is lagging uh, the rest of the world when it comes to data protection le legislation? And in your opinion, what is the likely roadmap for the US's hopeful adoption of similar laws in the future? 
Yeah. So um, the crazy thing about this, because it's been years that we've been working on trying to get bills passed, you know, it doesn't even matter if you're what side of the issue you're on. Like everyone, every, every legislator is going to tell you they care about privacy and that they want privacy legislation, but the devil's in the details. And the, the thing that's holding it up in the United States has nothing to do with privacy. It's all about the, like, it's all about uh, questions like, should there be state preemption? Should, uh, what sizes of the of companies should be covered? Uh, should it include, uh, you know, the our government? Like, should a federal privacy law also, like our federal government um, agencies be abiding by it as well? Uh, you know, it, it, you know, the questions like that, right? Should it apply to nonprofits? Um, but the one that's the thorniest issue is, you know, should individuals have a right to sue if their privacy uh, has been has been um, breached or or there was negligence or or something? And of course, big businesses, big tech, big like they that is the sticky point, right? They don't want a flood of legislation, uh, not legislation, excuse me, litigation from individuals who are claiming things, even if they're wrong, that's going to cost them a lot of money. Uh, if they're, if the individuals are right, it's going to cost a lot of money. It's just, they just see it as this, uh, a huge cost that they just don't want to think about how to surmount. And so unfortunately, the EU is principle based, and it, it, it and it, and the federal law applies to literally everybody and everything, uh, you know, not everything is personal data, like business, like my name and my business emails, not personal data. Uh, but, you know, so context matters for everything with privacy. Um, and it's really hard for, so, so, so that, that's what the main issue is. Uh, what do I think is going to end up happening? Unfortunately, I think we're just going to see, we've seen three states already pass privacy laws. Um, that are comprehensive around data, you know, affording new rights and such, but they're limited by the fact that they have to carve around other federal laws. Like, like the reason we have opt outs under the California law and not opt in is because uh, can spam exists and other federal uh, privacy laws that have been on the books for a long time. And as states, they're not uh, they're not allowed to, circ to to add their own versions. So it's really now states are trying to carve out things around existing federal laws. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. It's going to get more nuanced. It's going to be harder to comply with the various different states and everyone's just going to keep calling for more federal privacy law. I think in the Trump administration, like literally, I think the players, there were just, there were butting heads. There was no way I was saying there's no way that they're going to pass federal privacy law. I think just given the players within this current administration, there might be more opportunity because uh, to pass one, but there's also so many problems going on in the U.S. right now that it's, uh, but, th but this is a main, major challenge because we as the United States are not considered uh, a, a, a country that has acceptable privacy laws, and that's adding a lot more friction in the business space. So trying to contract with, you know, globally, it's, uh, you know, we have to jump through more hoops because, and, and show more attestations and, and assurances because our country doesn't have uh, the legal protections that the, the rest of the world thinks we should have. And we have a federal, we have a there's also fear that the U.S. federal government could just get subpoenas for uh, and, and get access to data for, uh, you know, FISA and other other like, you know, secretive, uh, I don't want to say laws, but the processes are. And, and so there's little insight into it. And the, the EU does not agree that that's a right, that that's appropriate. So that is my long winded short answer. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great answer, Deborah. One thing I would add. From our perspective, is this is one of the one of the rationale behind us thinking ourselves as the gear makers because you just described probably like fifteen different variations, uh, you know, based on geography, based on state, based on context, based on industry, whatever. Where you're going to have to tailor the platform a little bit differently. So that's that's we've kind of seen that obviously in healthcare and in the world that you know I've been in largely, that you know it's not a one size fits all. What works though is if you can build clever software that can be tailored and adapted without rebuilding, re like, you know, kind of rejiggering with ex a lot of expensive development costs to meet specific needs. So what that means then is that if I'm working as an example with, with a, with a client, you know, who's, who's, um, or, 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 you know, whose focus is, is say uh, global clinical trials, like, like Pfizer as an example, right? Really my thing would be to work with their, their policy experts 
the, the compliance and privacy experts to understand the specific rules, mm -hmm. right? That need to be complied to and, and how the, the, the cadence and, and the frequency they change and things like this and codify that along with the other gears that are there. Because there's no way I, on earth, I or anybody else for that matter, I don't think could build that, you know, upfront for like every organization, every context, you know, over, over time, right? And I think that's, that's really our mentality is, is we know things are changing. So let's make sure that there's some kind of gears that you can really rely on and then just build additional things around it, such as the workflow and, and you know, validation and things like this, because all of that will be different from context to context, right? Right, privacy is all about context. So, so absolutely right. And then, um, and then that's why it's also essential to abstract this out, to make it easier to make it right. I mean, that's, otherwise it just seems like, uh, this seems too overwhelming to fix our organization and companies just sweep it under the rug and pretend no one's looking, right? <laughs> yeah. So question from um, Jiro Olcott, who's in the community at uh, the company Power Transition. He says, how does the report generator grant permission to access a doc? to viewing participants? Um, so I assume this is for me. I don't know what the report generator is per se, but the answer is that it doesn't. Uh, we don't, there is no direct access from our reporting or our logging tool to the actual documents. And the way we do it is really through traditional kind of like identity as a um, identity management as a service type of approach. We are working, we're going ultimately the, the, the right, long-term kind of plan is, is to, to have decentralized identifiers because because NFTs are, are globally and, and, and kind of uniquely indivisible and, and available, or rather they're indivisible and globally unique. And if you have decentralized identifiers, you could essentially do a one-to-one -one mapping. However, that's, that's a nirvana, right? We're nowhere near that. So our path right now is, is more traditional, what, what we call like, you know, kind of uh, access control and user permissioning using a kind of a like a um, odd zero type of, of an approach uh, or like really odd to compatible approach. And then from there to, to get to verify credentials, which is I think that the next practical step uh, and, and then ultimately this, but, but the, the, the specific answer is that you can't go from the reporting directly to the data, uh, to the documents. Excellent. And uh, Jira had a follow-up question too around your business model. Is it all free or paid and then um, we kind of talked about this in the pre-screening around users, uh, you know, do users have to top up their wallets for the service? Is that something that exists on the platform? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. So, uh, you know, we, uh, <laughs> sometimes it feels like it's free because we have to do a lot of work before we get to some kind of, of you know, critical mass and, and clients, you know, uh, there's always some issues in, in terms of just getting through the, the, the cycle. But the net of it is we have a very simple software as a service. Uh, kind of subscription model, we abstract all of the, the tokenization, the, the native cryptocurrency, managing wallets, managing keys, and all of that for on behalf of our clients. So our, our users, and our users are really B2B, right? We're not talking about consumers in this case. Uh, they don't, it's, they know that there's, there's some blockchain-y things happening, but they're not interacting with it directly. We abstract that completely from them. We think based on the, the, the industry to work with, the clients we work with, their, their conservative, conservative nature. And also, frankly, uh, the fact that this removes distraction, this gives them the benefit of, of this idea of, of kind of evidence of authenticity, yet not all of the complexity of managing your own you know, wallets and keys and, and coins and things like this. We think that that's the right approach at this moment. You know, we obviously keep an eye Brady on, on, on alternative approaches too, but, but right now we think this abstraction and, and software as a service is the way to go. Yeah, and we are starting to see a lot more of that too, just obfuscating the complexities uh, and the regulatory risks uh, perceived by some companies for managing cryptocurrency and paying fees in HBAR and the tax implications and things like that. Having a, a middle layer manage that for you, especially when it's a B2B company. Um, I mean, that seems to be trending a lot more. Yeah. Um, a question from Josh Lawler around NFTs. I think this question is, is more geared towards if this was done on the token service versus the consensus service. Um, so I can take this one as, as a reminder that NFTs through rights hash are through the consensus service. Uh, the question's about storage space on an NFT on Hedera. Uh, could you store medical imaging files? If not, does it use a pointer like to IPFS or another decentralized storage system? 
And can you steer the location of the storage, even if it's not on a node? So with Hedera token service NFTs, there is a 100 byte memo field that you can, uh, you can throw in a, a URL, you can link to a file that lives on you know, Filecoin IPFS, you could store it anywhere um, and link to it within that, that memo field. Uh, if it's information that you want to have immutable and, and stored in a decentralized way, I would definitely recommend doing it on an IPFS or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's it for uh, HTS question there. I'm ready to just um, add, um, sorry to interrupt you. For obviously, we use HCS, but HCS also has a 1024 byte memo field. That's where you guys saw the some some of the you know the breadcrumbing that we left publicly. You know uh, that that's what we use for doing that, right? Obviously, you know we um, we are as part of our roadmap for Rice Hash. Like the, the next phase is, is to basically look at IPFS. Well, I mean, we've already looked at it, but implement IPFS. Uh, you know, as part of uh, I guess for, for, for very specific use cases where, where the clients would need decentralized storage as well. Right now, what we have found, just honestly, is, is that centralized, like like truly secure, monitored, um, geographically distributed, centralized storage through public infrastructure is good enough. It's a lot lower cost, it's a lot lower complexity. Uh, and for the use case we've come across, it's met the requirements, right? So, so we're not close to it. However, we don't wanna, we, we don't wanna manufacture use cases that don't actually exist at this stage. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Um, do you see the consent service being used globally and adopted by other platforms or APIs? And if so, um, how do you see accountability in that being enforced? Yeah, they should, I mean, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, again, uh, I think this is truly, I think ACS is, is Hedera secret sauce when it comes to services. Uh, you know, I have all kinds of respects for other things that are out there, HTS, et cetera. But this, this is the, the, the secret sauce, right? You can do, it's very, very uh, flexible. It's highly versatile. You know, you talked a little bit earlier about program, um, the ability to program right, on HTS. You, you could do a lot of it, and that's what we do, a lot of it, not everything. You could do a lot of it using uh, offline APIs and, and the AppNet concept with HCS. So, and, and it's super easy to use, right? I mean, I think this is Lehman's second greatest creation. Um, so yeah, we really like it. We think it's highly usable. We, we encourage people to look at it. You know, it's not a silver bullet for everything. And you do have to, again, kind of going back to my, my idea about gear makers, you really need to know what you're doing, right? So I'm not trying to trivialize it, but it's very, very powerful. So yeah, I would highly encourage it. Excellent. And um, a question from Greg here, where do you see, or where are the PDFs uh, in the demo being stored? Yeah, this goes back to the, the answer I just gave. They're actually being stored on one of those seven geographical locations that I showed in my, my demo uh, around the world. They're, they're, we actually use a, a kind of a triumvirate of three different public clouds. We have uh, four nodes on Amazon, two on Google Cloud, and one on Azure. So, so you know, we actually, that's where it's physically stored. Uh, and then depending on other requirements, such as physical isolation and things like this, then, then we may choose to store it in a specific location versus another. Excellent. And the recording is going to be available after this too. So if you're looking to reference back at some of those, um, that information around storage, uh, you'll be able to in the next couple hours or so. Um, uh, another question, why create or use NFTs to track consent instead of just a transaction record on a public blockchain? And um, this person's curious about sort of the distinctions between those two. Yeah, you know, I think this ultimately this goes back to this idea of, of with the NFT we have. And again, to be clear, we're not fractionalizing the NFT. We're not, this is, this is a kind of a unique, whole, uh, indivisible, global identifier. Uh, and I think it provides evidence of authenticity, uh, more so than, than, you know, like a fungible token wouldn't do that. Uh, a transaction you know, wouldn't do it. So, so we think in, in our, with, with our thinking that this is really the right tool for doing it, particularly when it can do it economically, right? If, if you know, if our, uh, you know, scenario was to use Ethereum and it would cost us a thousand dollars to associate one PDF, you know, as a consent, then clearly we wouldn't do that. That would be very foolish. 
Um, I also just wanted to add in, I mean, I loved what you said, uh, and I just wrote it down because um, you know, NFT is an evidence of authenticity, but, uh, and then you talked about it being an identifier. It is a pseudonymous identifier. So just keeping that, um, and, and what's interesting there is it's pseudonymous to the ACOR organization, and it enables to keep that pseudonymity. Uh, it's not anonymous to you because if you couldn't do what you're doing if the data had nothing to reference, right? So you need to, you need it to be pseudonymous. But anybody else who's looking it up and looks it up, it, to them it's completely anonymous. So, you know, in talking about identifiers and such, I just wanted to make that clear that it, it, it's kind of a great. I, I love this concept. And I might even want to write a blog post or something on it, like an NFT as a pseudonymous identifier. I just think it's yeah, it's a really good point, Deborah. Thank real you. Real good innovation. Um, this person's question is around the architecture between um, HCS and HTS. Uh, do you see data integrity use cases in which events are published to the ledger for consensus, then being wrapped into tokens as sort of a standardized data format um, and also benefiting from interoperation? Yeah, you know, it's a really good question, Matthew. Um, so yes, I do. In fact, one of the things I'm working, you, you may notice, Brady, uh, I'm part of this uh, IEEE kind of um, basically blockchain interoperability standards um, team. And one of the, we're actually literally kind of working on this, this paper on, on, we call it basically interoperability for healthcare tokenization. So it's around healthcare, uh, but but nonetheless, it's this idea of, of you know, if, if you wrap, you know, kind of, Data, not data, but references data, yes, such as, for instance, your, your um, I don't know, like eye scan data, which is, which is a real example. Um, and then you want to use a token as some kind of a, in some kind of a, like a secondary data marketplace, right? Um, so, so, that, so, so you don't have ethical concerns. Then how do you go across different ledgers? It's, it's not trivial, right? Uh, and then you talked a little bit earlier about, you know, if, if you, you know, use, you know, kind of going back to the idea of not forking, right? If, if you have forks and, and then you have the same, essentially kind of NFT rep representing um, or same NFT types representing different related data, how do you go across them? So it's not a really trivial thing. I think the answer is yes, you can do it. Um, I think you have to really carefully think through the use case still, right? And, and like, what exactly are you trying to represent? Does it actually make sense to use HTS or maybe you're using HTS at, a, at one level higher? So it's not it's not at this specific data. Maybe it's at the package level or some kind of a report level or something like this, which would be a lot easier to deal with, particularly if you're considering interoperability in the marketplace. But uh, all to say, I think this is a nascent space. Uh, I, I don't want to give the impression that I have like a whole lot of brilliant answers. All to say that we're actually looking at this very specifically. Awesome. Um, well, we are uh, unfortunately out of time here. Appreciate uh, Jim and Deborah jumping on and uh, all the thought leadership uh, that we learned today and information about RightsHash. And you can always go to rightshash.com to learn more, check out the demo. Um, we'll be sending out a recording of the presentation today as well. So be on the lookout for that in a couple hours. Um, anything from Jim or Deborah uh, before we and things here. Yeah, I really appreciate everyone being on the call. Lots of really brilliant, intelligent questions as always. Uh, at 5 p.m., I think Deborah and I are both on this Twitter spaces thing, yep. which is kind of kind of new to me. So if you guys are still not bored of us or, or me, Deborah is very interesting. Happy to continue oh. the conversation. <laughs> I, you know, it's always somebody else's uh, area of expertise is always it's always awe-inspiring to see like when I'm referring to you, I think everything you've done is really, really just amazing. Um, so the other thing I'd like to say is I've been working with um, uh, in creating a white paper that is um, not only outlining everything I went over today, but, you know, more comprehensive. Um, and so that, you know, I'm not exactly sure when it's coming out, but the draft has been uh, finalized and it's now being reviewed by the rest of the team. And so, uh, you know, it, it'll be soon that we'll be publishing that white paper on um, how privacy, uh, or sorry, how uh, uh, DLT is a privacy architecture for Web3. So um, look forward to that. Excellent. And then yeah, later today. Not across Twitter and the website. And so we'll make sure everyone's notified um, once that's available. Excellent. Um, Thanks again, Jim and Deborah. Thanks everybody for joining and uh, we will catch you all later. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.